Are you excited to be here? Yes. All right. I'm very excited to be here. It's great to see all the people uh, in, live, in person here. And we have a, a really exciting day planned for you here. But I'm going to start by talking about a topic that I am personally very passionate about. You know, I've really built my, my, the last 15 years of my career and what I do around this one topic. How do we care about developer experience? You know, I started my life, my journey as a software developer. You know, I still am a software developer. You know, a lot of people think of me as a founder, entrepreneur, business person, but I still take a lot of pride in being a software developer. And I do really care, really, really care about developer experience. And I do believe people don't talk about it enough. It's one of the most important topics that's affecting lives of, we have 30 million software developers in the world. Uh, it's affecting their lives. It's affecting you know, not just the quality of software they're producing, but really the, the work life they experience every day. And if you look at uh, you know, what's happening around software developers for the 30 million software developers, there are very, very few who have a good developer experience. And so I, I, I want to start today by talking about what does good developer experience even mean? And uh, 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 going into a little bit deeper into it. A lot of academic research is happening on this topic. You know, how do we uh, really even think about developer experience? And it comes down to three, uh, three core pillars of it. Number one is flow state. You know, if, you, if you have written code, you know, writing code is problem solving. You're solving a problem. So you want to be in that zone uh, and go, get in the flow state to, to write code and solve some problems. You know, when, when, whenever I've written code, I put my headphones on, put my favorite music, get in the zone, and get, get stuff done. And that's really important part for developer experience. So anything that uh, creates interruptions uh, from whether it's, uh, you know, you're, you're waiting for builds to finish, and you can't even get in your, your, your problem solving zone because of that, or you are uh, uh, you know, uh, interrupted to troubleshoot something, uh, you, you're out of your flow state. And that really creates bad developer experience. The second part of developer experience is feedback loops. Developers like to have uh, short feedback loops. Because problem solving is inherently uh, an iterative exercise. So you want a faster iteration because you solve a problem, you, know, you do your first attempt at solving a problem, you want feedback so that you can solve it better. So developers don't have good, good experience and they get frustrated if it takes too long. If you write code and it's sitting, on the, uh, it's sitting there for two weeks or four weeks before it goes live in production, that's bad experience. So that's the code element of developer experience. The third is, is cognitive load. You know, how much cognitive load a developer has to, ha has to deal with uh, for you know, things that they have to do to solve their problems. And what happens most of the times is you know, uh, there's so much uh, stuff that's irrelevant to solving your code problem. Uh, so much stuff that's happening around you. You, know, you have to learn the internals of Kubernetes. You have to figure out you know, some deployment script someone wrote five years ago and try to figure that out. So all of these things create cognitive load that really slows down developer experience and becomes a burden on developer experience. Right? And if you look at the data out there, and if we, at Harness, we have been very passionate about this, so we've been collecting a lot of data over, over, over the last many years here. Only about 40, 50% of developer time is spent solving problems and writing code. The other 50, 60% of the time is going into something that's not really value add to, to, the, to the developer experience, to what the developer really wants to do, what as a business you want your developers to do. And that's where, and all of that is the toil that the developers are experiencing uh, pretty much all the time. And the toil is not just one thing. It's really death by a thousand cuts. You know, you, and we, we collect a lot of data through, through hundreds and hundreds of evaluations that we have done uh, you know, uh, to, with a lot of software engineering teams. And it could be that 15% of the time, developer time is getting wasted in uh, you know, waiting for slow and failed builds. 10% is wasted on babysitting and uh, troubleshooting deployments. 5% on manual security and compliance reviews. 4% on creating and maintaining pipelines, and 3% on diagnosing cloud costs, and, and, and so on. And it could be different in different teams. But the reality is, a lot of the developer time goes in, in toil. And if you look at, you have 30 million software developers in the world. You know, as software developers, we are moving the world forward, but 40 to 50% of our time is always wasted in things that no one really wants to do. And no one really, uh, you know, as a business, you don't really want your developers to spend that much time on it, right? There is true business impact of it, of not fixing the developer experience. Uh, if you look at this study from McKinsey, and uh, where they pulled in a lot of data from companies, they would score at the top 25% of developer experience and developer velocity. Four to five X faster revenue growth compared to the bottom 75%, 55% higher innovation rate, 60% higher shareholder returns, and 20% higher operating margins. 
So that's like real, real business impact, not, not small numbers, like huge business impact of, of fixing and having the right developer experience and the right velocity to any, any business out there. So let's talk about how do we fix this. You know, a lot of times, okay, developer experience is a, is a problem, but why haven't we fixed it? And I really believe the solution is actually not that complex. Solution is quite simple that we have to achieve excellence in how we do engineering. And if you look at what is excellence normally, excellence is doing ordinary things extraordinarily well. So all the ordinary things I talked about, waiting for slow, uh, slow and failed builds, troubleshooting and babysitting deployments and security and compliance reviews and pipelines and all the things that happen, if you start doing those extraordinarily well, you create an engineering excellence uh, culture. You are doing engineering in an ex excellent way. And you do engineering in an excellent way, you're reducing all the toil, and you go and fix your developer experience. And that's, the, that's, that's how we believe, like, you know, it's the, the core of how people have to start thinking about it. That's not really complicated. You have to break down the problem into smaller things and start doing those smaller things extraordinarily well. And then the aggregate, you, are ex you become excellent in doing engineering, and that's how you know, developer experience gets better. So as we, at Harness, we have been giving this a lot of thought, and we talk to hundreds and hundreds of uh, companies and engineering leaders all the time. And what we found was the number one challenge for a lot of organizations and a lot of engineering leaders is there is no way to, for them to think about, you know, how do you get a systematic engineering approach to getting there? You know, can, you know as, as engineers and technologists, we like to you know, have a, you want to engineer our path to something. And there is really no path because there is no way to even know where to start with. Uh, there are really no standards of uh, what engineering excellence means. Uh, you know, what, is there a benchmark for it? Is there a standardized practice for it? Can you find a score of, you know, on a score of 1 to 100, where are you today? Uh, you know, are you you're at 95, excellent in engineering, or you're at 35, not so good in doing, in doing engineering? And there is really no good way of doing it. So what we, at Harness, we took an initiative in the last uh, uh, six months or so, and we're gonna talk about it later today uh, a bit more, in, in more detail is to bring in a community, to build a community of engineering leaders. So we have about 300 engineering leaders on it. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a community where engineering leaders are coming in uh, to have a conversation on what engineering excellence really means, and can we really define it? And with, the, with one goal, that can we create an engineering excellence maturity model, which is a well-defined maturity model you know, with benchmarks where you can compare against, so you can start becoming uh, extraordinary about each of the different elements of, of how you do engineering and how do you achieve engineering excellence. Uh, what we found was there are 11 facets of engineering excellence, you know, and, and they are anywhere from you know how your developers do learning and development, how do they do discover, uh, how do they discover things, and the documentation around how you do engineering, quality and resiliency testing, security and governance process, metrics and insights in your STLC, your build process, your deployment process, your developer environments, your planning and requirement process, incident management, development process. That if we if we look at these 11 facets and start tuning and optimizing each one of those, and get, start getting excellent at each one of those, that's how we become excellent in doing engineering in, uh, as, a, as a whole. And that's, uh, that's what drives the, the developer experience uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in, a, in, the, in the long term. Let me talk about Harness here, our mission at Harness. You know, Harness, we started about five years ago now with one single mission, that can we create a platform to help engineering organizations uh, to achieve this? Uh, can we create a platform where, where software engineers are enabled uh, to ship code that they're writing uh, quickly, efficiently, reliably all the time? And there are 30 million software developers in the world, and we think we can, if we can help even a, you know, a small number of those developers, we can make a big impact there. And that's what we have been building in, at Harness for the last, last five years. And if you look at Harness platform, uh, the, the key pillars of Harness platform, uh, number one, is next generation CI CD. Uh, that's, where we, uh, that's where we put a lot of our energy and focus. Uh, CI CD, you know, all our journeys with CI CD started with Jenkins. You know, Jenkins is a you know, uh, great project, but 20 year old project now. And it served its purpose, did extremely well, 
but it's really not suitable for where the industry has moved, where software engineering has moved, where you know where the you know the where, what the experience that developers need now is not suitable. So we started with can we completely rethink and re refine, uh, redefine what a modern next generation CI CD looks like? You know when when we think of what a modern CI looks like, we think of what's the number one challenge that developers face with CI that they're frustrated with slow builds that the builds are slow, and you know it's, it, they may have to wait for one hour for a build to finish. Can we bring it down from one? hour to 15 minutes so that there is no impact on the developer flow state there and that's how so we designed our ci with you know with the goal that can we build the fastest ci on the planet and we published a lot of data about it actually in the in my keynote uh, last year i sh we showed on a live you know a build happening on on github actions versus a build happening on on harness ci and we are about 5x faster and, and we, uh, we published a lot of data publicly around it with the goal that can we redefine the developer experience around CI by solving the problem of making builds to go faster and remove the slow builds and uh, you know, remove all the bottlenecks around troubleshooting failed builds and them taking too long, et cetera. When we looked at CD, when we launched CD, we, uh, you know, we, we looked at how do we simplify challenges around CD on fully automated pipelines, you know, doing, uh, uh, reducing the risk around deployments with Canary deployments, blue-green deployments that can, you can very easily do, great developer experience, making sure that you can uh, verify deployments automatically, making sure you can roll back deployments automatically when, the, when they fail. And our feature flags module in our platform designed to bring smarts to feature flags. So like you know, security and governance and the right developer experience and uh, writing flags as code uh, to give you the full uh, CI CD, which is your you build, deploy, release, uh, and the entire life cycle around it. The next area in our platform is uh, integrated shift left security. For most organizations, uh, you know, just building and deploying is not enough. You have to bring security in it. You know, it's a key element of it. Uh, a huge focus on shift left of security. The reality is, shift left security is hard to achieve. Uh, it's it's hard to get your engineering teams and development teams to bring that all in. So we, we uh, our module around software uh, testing orchestration brings everything that you have your SaaS scanners, DAS scanners, IS scanners, all of them very easily integrated into your pipelines and full governance around it and ability to uh, to find vulnerabilities and fix them uh, early in the developer flow. The third area of our harness platform is integrated resilience and quality. You know, you, you don't want to do just CI CD uh, and, uh, and get the, you know, uh, the deployment velocity. You also want to make sure that everything is resilient, what, you're sh what we are shipping. So we have, we, our modules uh, that we have been launching uh, over the last few years, chaos engineering, which is the practice of bringing uh, uh, chaos testing in your uh, DevOps process. So you, could, uh, you can simulate fa failures so that the failures are not happening in production. Your systems are more resilient. Service reliability management, practice of uh, tracking your service level objectives and error budgets, so you have a context and a framework of managing the, your DevOps velocity. Continuous error tracking, so your developers can find errors early on and, uh, and fix the errors early on before they impact your, impact your users, and doing all of this in your, in your pre-production DevOps life cycles. And the final area that we have looked at uh, in Harness Platform, where we have strong capabilities, uh, uh, cloud cost management and software engineering insights. Uh, the, the goal here is to optimize your costs. And costs could be infrastructure, costs could be people and process. And there are inefficiencies everywhere. And uh, our, our goal has been that can we bring uh, uh, the visibility inside cloud costs uh, and automation for cloud costs in your DevOps lifecycle and your, in, in your uh, how software engineers do their job. So you're not reacting to cloud costs after the fact. And then finally, you know, uh, an area that, uh, that we, we launched early this year, Software Engineering Insights, that I, I personally am very passionate about because that creates a measurability framework. Most people don't even know how good you are uh, on software engineering. And that's where, you know, by having, a, having data, that we can pull in data from everything you have in your developer tool chain, whether it's uh, Git repos or CICD or Jenkins or, you know, Jira, uh, PagerDuty, everything comes together in one place so you can understand your Dora metrics or every, any other metric that you want to have to understand what's happening in a software engineering and you, and you tune in and all. Another area about harness platform that uh, I want to highlight is AI. You, know, you, you can't go anywhere in Silicon Valley right now without talking about AI, but I like to remind people that harness was actually the first one uh, to start with AI for DevOps. And you know, when Harness was launched as a startup out of stealth, our headline on TechCrunch had AI in it that you know, Harness is launching a continuous delivery product that uses AI to solve some of the challenges around, uh, around deployments. 
And that was our continuous verification technology where we brought in ML and AI to figure out uh, you know, if a deployment is going to break something or not. So we, we, we have always been at the forefront of bringing AI to DevOps. And uh, we brought in our test intelligence technology, which is bringing uh, uh, ML and AI to CI. And when, we, when, I, when I say our CI is 4 to 5x faster than any other CI, that's the core secret sauce of it, that, that having that AI that can optimize you know, how you run tests and what tests you run. So and, uh, this year, we launched Harness IDA. IDA is AI for uh, development assistance. Uh, and now you have generative AI, which is, uh, which is really great, uh, uh, I say, leap in how, how, how we can use to fix developer experience and get the de DevOps and developer workflows to get better, uh, whether it's fixing vulnerabilities, you know, troubleshooting uh, build errors and deployment failures, uh, you know, creating policies around cost, and all kind of work that happens. Uh, uh, we can reduce some of the toil using help of generative AI. So we har harness, at Harness, we believe in, in uh, using AI uh, at, to its maximum strength as a help and as, a, as an assistant to developers, DevOps engineers, platform engineers, SecOps engineers, to in, in the entire SDLC to do their job better. And we, we continue to, uh, to, to build on that history of AI that Harness had. Harness platform is designed to have this one integrated uh, offering, but four, four key uh, elements that we, uh, that we focus on. Number one is I talked about the use of AI to optimize uh, the DevOps workflows, uh, continuous verification, test intelligence, uh, IDA. Uh, number two is bringing security and governance very deeply embedded in the DevOps workflows. So you don't have that friction between, the, between your DevOps and engineering teams and what the, the, your security teams want. It's all one system, that the security doesn't is not an afterthought. It's is built in into the pipelines. It's built in, uh, in through in your policy framework. So we have a uh, OPA, open policy agent based uh, guardrail uh, framework. Uh, very very fine grained RBAC access control, uh, secrets management that is embedded into it. Uh, and then third, we focus a lot on developer uh, first experience. You know everything that developers need to to have a, a great experience with your your DevOps and CI/CD tooling. You know which is you know configuration as code, how they would want to do and put the configuration in Git repos and manage it through that. You know a very beautiful visual editors to to edit pipelines if they would want. You know APIs to automate everything, and then uh, ability to build dashboards and analytics in a in a in, in a in a in a flexible way. And finally, we, uh, one thing that we really differentiate on is that it's, everything is very modular. And every module we, we ship, I talked about the modules that we have on our platform, is designed to be best of breed. But we don't ask our, our users, our customers, to, to buy it all. You, can, you have the choice. You can start with CI. You can start with CD. You can start with our cloud cost management. You can start with our feature flags. You can start with you know, three or four or five of our modules. But it's one integrated uh, product for us with multiple modules that we, people have choice to start, uh, start moving to the next generation of DevOps, next generation of uh, software delivery in any of the areas where you find the, the biggest weaknesses are for, for, for your organization. What I take a lot, of, uh, a lot of pride in is delivering outcomes. Like, you know, we, at Harness, I talked about, we started five years ago with this mission that can we solve some of these problems? Can we bring the next generation solutions for DevOps to the market? And we have, we, uh, I'm, I'm very proud that we have been able to deliver outcomes to, to thousands and thousands of software engineering teams now. Uh, you have, you know, on velocity, increase of velocity, higher governance, higher quality, higher efficiency. Uh, you know, a few examples here, and many of you are in the audience here. So first of all, thank you. and. Uh, uh, for, for, for being Harness users and being a partner uh, with us. Uh, United Airlines accelerates deployment by 75%. Enter increased deployments from twice per week to 14 times a day. Ancestry increased governance led to 50% uh, decrease in outages. Uh, log me in. Uh, standardized CI/CD pipelines leading to less than one hour service onboarding. Deluxe decreased code security issues noise by 95%. Uh, bust MS reduced annual downtime from six uh, uh, six days to minutes. Efficiency, you know, if you look at it, Discover Dollar cut their cloud cost by 70%. Imagine 70%. Uh, Carvana 92% time uh, decrease in time to provision infrastructure resources, and that's how we measure ourselves. Like, have we delivered those outcomes? So the outcomes for engineering excellence, out outcomes for developer experience, they have to translate into business outcomes. Like, you know, and uh, are we are, are is you know, if you fix developer experience, you become excellent in doing things. Is it translating to what your business needs? And we we take a take a lot lot of uh, uh, pride in uh, doing that. 
And we've done this through a, a, a continuous journey of innovation. You know, you see the Harness platform today. Our first module in the, in the market that when we launched was continuous delivery uh, in 2018. 2020, uh, we added continuous integration. 2021, we added feature flags and cloud cost management. 22, we added enterprise GitOps to our continuous delivery uh, capability uh, and security testing orchestration, service reliability management, and uh, uh, chaos engineering. And 23, earlier in the year, we launched our software engineering insights. And uh, uh, in the spring, we launched uh, our AI, uh, IDA, AI for development uh, assistance. Uh, so a lot of innovation happening, uh, you know, continuously, and uh, that's that's an area we want to continue to build. You know, that we are innovating and bringing the best solutions for engineering excellence to fix the developer toil and to increase the developer uh, experience here. So today, I'm very excited to announce our. Uh, new set of uh, capabilities and innovations here. Our engineering team have been uh, working really hard, uh, you know, and uh, I'm here uh, very excited to showcase some of the, the new capabilities that, that we are announcing. So we have four new modules in our platform today that, uh, that we are announcing. So very exciting day for us, and uh, uh, I hope uh, uh, you know, we can bring some of these great solutions to you uh, very quickly. Number one is Harness Code Repository. <laughs> <laughs> Well, see, uh, the world needs, world needs a new, modern, next generation code repository, and we'll talk about it. Uh, uh, our number uh, two module that we're announcing today is Harness Internal Developer Portal. Uh, <laughs> our next module we're going to announce today, Harness Infrastructure as Code Management. Uh, <laughs> And then finally, so Harness Software Supply Chain Assurance to bring. <laughs> Exciting day, right? So time for live demos now. You know, it's live demos. Those of you who have learned live, live demos, uh, they are, you know, it's a bold and courageous move by our product teams. And, you know, I'm, I'm very proud of our product teams to, uh, to take on that bold step. But we're going to show you everything, everything live here on the stage as, as we do that. Uh, so let's start with uh, our code repository. Our, uh, our code repository is really the first major Git repo launch in, in a decade. Gitness, as you can imagine, Gitness by Harness, uh, and uh, it's, it it's goes live today. The four key elements of Gitness, uh, uh, one is uh, it's open source. We decided that Git started with open source. You know, It has fundamentally open source ethos from day one when Git was invented. And so we have to uh, create, when we are creating Git repo, Gitness, we have to give it back to the open source community. And there is really no major uh, you know, uh, open source Git for a long time. So we decided to do a full Apache license and put it in the open source community. Number two is, uh, is ultra lightweight. Uh, it's really ultra lightweight. You know, most of the Git repos have become pretty bloated now. Uh, we look at like a setup is less than 30 seconds. If you want, you can run it on a, the smallest possible uh, you know, uh, machine in the cloud, $4 DigitalOcean instance, you can run it on. Third is, it's uh, everything from code to deployment. So you know we have a very strong pipeline engine from our CI CD, so that pipeline engine is very seamlessly integrated into, the, in, in, into this Git repo. Uh, and so you have the full code to deployment lifecycle there. And number four is supercharged with AI. And you know, if, if, we, if we had the luxury of building it now in the, in, in, the, in the time of AI, so we have really infused AI into every element of it, and we plan to continue to infuse AI into every element of it. And it's, it's, so it's everything, uh, it leverages the power of AI here. So with me, joining me on the stage uh, is Brad, our VP of product, and Brad is going to show what we're doing with Gitness. All right, thank you, Jyoti. <laughs> I'm really excited to be demoing this for the first time in public today. <laughs> so let's, let's recap a few things. 30 second install, lightweight, lightning fast, governance, security, infused with generative AI. Let's take this thing for a spin. <laughs> so the first thing I'm gonna do is we're gonna go to the Gitness documentation and we're gonna copy the installation command and we're gonna jump right over to a terminal and I'm gonna do a live installation. Now what's happening is we distribute Gitness as a compact uh, Docker image with zero external dependencies. And so you can see right now we're already up and running. And now I can just open this up and I'm presented with the, the, the registration screen. So. That was a bit less than 30 seconds. Well, you know, 30 <laughs> seconds, yeah. 
Let's, so the, the, the first step when you log in is you're going to create a project. A uh, project is where you organize your repositories, and then you invite your team members to collaborate with you. So we'll do that real quick. Once I'm in a project, I can create my first repository. And we'll create a test repository. We'll add a readme. And there it is. 30 seconds up and running. Yeah. yeah. Simple, lightweight, lightning fast. It just works. This is how all software should be written right here. All right. So now let's explore a real open source repository that we've imported into Guinness so we can take this thing for a test drive. So you can see this has all the essential features that you would expect from a source control system. So we have the, the, the file viewer. We can click through. We can view files. Um, we can see the repository history. And we can even see the individuals that have changed individual lines of files. But if you're a developer, you're probably coming to the user interface for one main reason, which is pull requests. And so Harness has robust support for pull requests. So we'll open up a sample here. And this is where security and governance really matters. Right? This is where developers are coming in. They're suggesting code changes. They're collaborating. And this is where you, you want to have those assurances in place. You, you want to block code from being merged if your pipeline fails, if you have security vulnerabilities that are detected, if you don't have the right reviewers in place. Uh, these are all things that we can help prevent using our enterprise-grade security. But let's, let's dive deeper in, into pull requests. So you can see here the activity feed. We've had a pipeline that ran. We can see the individual co commits that comprise the pull request. We can see the changes. We have a side-by-side -side diff. And we have comments that we've added from reviewers. And then I think most importantly, we've brought in our pipeline engine directly into the pull request view. We've heard it from developers. You want your pipelines right next to your code to make pull request reviews as simple as possible. So while we're talking pipelines, let's see what it's like to create one. Making the developer experience simple was the most important thing here. And so like everything else, creating a pipeline is simple and fast. We're going to click the new pipeline button. And we'll call this unscripted. And this is going to drop me into our editor. As you expect, we do pipelines as code. And we bring both a code and a visual aspect to this. So we can come in here and we, we can add steps using our visual GUI. We can choose from hundreds of existing integrations that we can add, or we can edit the code. But my favorite feature here is that Gitness is intelligent enough to build our pipeline for us. So I'm going to click Generate. And you can see it built my pipeline for me. It was smart enough to know that this, yeah. it was smart enough to know that this was a Go repository, and so it added my installation and my test uh, commands, and now I can click Run. And you can see here it's already running. Again, lightning fast. How many CI systems start this quickly? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Zero. Well, no, Gitness, right? <laughs> one now. Yeah. So, you know, one thing when it comes to, uh, you know, pipelines and, the, and these types of tooling, I think we know that everyone is maybe a little unhappy with their current tools, but no one is in the mood for a big migration. We've heard you loud and clear. So let us do the migration for you. We've built that directly into Gitness. So we're going to come over here. And I have a couple repositories here in GitLab. We're going to create a new project that we are going to import uh, directly from GitLab. So I'm going to select GitLab as the provider. And let me grab the address. And Let's click Import. And here we go. We can see these repositories are being uh, imported, and it's already done. Again, with a the theme of lightning fast. 
In our testing, depending on the size of the repository, we can import uh, about 100 repositories a minute. So even for the largest engineering orgs with thousands or even tens of thousands of repositories, we can make migration a breeze. Whoa. Now, Whoa. the thing I wanted to highlight here is, you, so you can see the code's been imported, but Gitness was intelligent enough to recognize that I had a GitLab pipeline. And so if we go over here to the pipeline section, we can see that it automatically imported it and automatically converted it to the Gitness syntax. <laughs> and we can hit run right here. And again, just as you would expect, it's running all my, all my GitLab CI commands. All right, next step. So one thing we've heard from everyone is we know everyone loves open source, but you want those enterprise guarantees, the security, the governance, and so uh, that's why, as Jody mentioned, today we announced Harness Code Repository, which is Gitness, uh, like the enterprise edition of Gitness inside the Harness platform. And the cool thing is, uh, if you start with Gitness, we can give you a one-click button to upgrade from Gitness into the platform, which we'll demo right now. So I'm gonna go to the settings section, and we're gonna click upgrade. This is where I enter my Harness account. I'll enter my Harness organization. And then we'll start the upgrade. And so right now what, what's happening is Gitness is uploading my repositories and all my data right into the platform. So I can come over here and I can take advantage of all the platform features and capabilities. And so if I go to, and by the way, this is now Gitness running inside the platform, as you can see, and we can see the repositories have been imported. Yeah. So once you are in the platform, this is where you can take advantage of all the features that Harness has to offer. You have access to all the other modules, the security, the governance. Uh, but one other thing I wanted to highlight was the generative AI aspect and IDA. And so we're gonna go over here to an existing repository that we've uploaded, it's Gitness. And one of the things we asked ourselves was, was search. You know, we love ChatGPT, we love being able to ask it questions. What if I could ask questions about my code uh, within the platform? And so that's what we're gonna do right here. I'm gonna ask uh, Ida, where are the logs configured? I'll uh, we'll say logging, where is logging configured? So notice I did not search by keyword, which is typical. I asked it a question about my code base, and here it's actually returned the lines of code and the specific files where we configure our logging. And most importantly, it's right. This is, in fact, where we configure our logging. So I can now go and view that file. And so this is just one example of how we're using generative AI to make developers' lives easier and augment these existing experiences. So. If we go back to these slides. So let, let's do a, a quick recap. 30 second install, lightning fast, lightweight, security and governance, generative AI, code to deployment. Uh, and I think the, the best thing here is we're just getting started. This is our first launch. Yeah. So with that being said, please come visit us at the booth today. We'd love to have you as part of our community. Gitness is live. You can go to gitness.com. You can download and try it today. Remember, it only takes 30 seconds. And if you're a Harness customer or you're thinking about becoming a Harness customer, um, talk, out, talk to your rep and we can get you set up in our code repository beta, which is starting in about a month. All right. Whoa. Thank you. Hey. Let's, uh, let's give a very big hand to Brad and also our engineering team working very hard on, the, on, on the, our Gitness and Harness Code repository. A lot of innovation went into it, so give a big hand to our teams here. As, as Brad said, this is how all software should be built. So I, I like, you know, that, that, that is the mindset. You know, simplicity of experience, security and governance, generative AI built into it, easy to get started, everything. Uh, you know, it's, it's great, great experience that we have, that we have designed, uh, designed for you here. 
Now let's talk about our next module launch, Harness uh, Internal Developer Portal. Internal developer portals or IDPs are a big trend right now. You know, as you, need, as you, as you, as you uh, know, there's a lot of work when a new developer comes on board. A new developer joins an organization, can take them two months to be productive before they can start doing the job. You know, uh, for a developer to start on a new project or a new app or building a new, could be like uh, uh, about 100 ServiceNow tickets or Jira tickets to get the process going, like create a new code repo and build this and do this and do this. And it could be weeks and weeks of process to figure out what's, what's happening. So a Harness Internal Developer Portal is built on Backstage, which is a popular open source project uh, that uh, Spotify uh, 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 um, gave it to the community. We are an important part of the community now and participating that uh, heavily in there. Uh, and the core capabilities of Harness Internal Developer Portal, uh, first of all, is to reduce the developer's cognitive load. And I talked about cognitive load, how that is a big problem for developer experience by having a software catalog. Uh, second is you know, uh, to measure service maturity and promote best practices using scorecards so you can see uh, you know, what's happening for each of the services, you know, where they are, people can compare and, and, and improve things. And third is uh, a service onboarding uh, workflow. Service, new service onboarding that you can do in minutes instead of weeks or months that happens uh, while you, you remain very compliant because you have golden paths uh, very well defined here. So with me on the stage is uh, Eric, our, uh, VP of, our Director of Product Marketing here to show a live demo. All right. Thank you, Jody. Hello, everybody. I, this is really exciting. How software is working right now, we have so many microservices, so many small teams, it can be really overwhelming for a developer, particularly the new developer you were mentioning. And I want to look at the developer portal through the eyes of that new developer, right? So let's say I'm new, I've joined this e-commerce organization, we got a boutique, and I'm working on the front end service, right? But I'm also going to have to create a new service, like a recommendation engine around this. Trying to find all the information can be so hard when you get started. And what we've done in the developer portal is we've created one place where you can bring it all together. If I'm getting started, I need to go to docs. I've got my install of the prereqs in my app. I've got my APIs right here. And then I can even bring in other tool chain information like our CI CD system, right? What are my recent builds, deploys, have they run? Do I need to restart them at my fingertips? And then I've got a good map of my relationships. I can see how my service fits into the larger ecosystem, which services depend on me, and what libraries and APIs do I consume. Right? So I can go find their API documentation rather than asking someone to ask someone to ask someone where this information is hidden. I stay in the flow, right? I can stay productive. The other big place where I think you get these breaks in productivity is when you need something or you need to initiate something. And you end up like filing five tickets and then waiting a while and then following up on your tickets and it, ugh, it's just the worst. So what we've put together is a self-service hub, right? Where the platform engineering team can help me as a developer. They can put together those golden paths those pre-built automation workflows, so that all I have to do is say, oh, okay, I'm creating this recommendation engine. I need to build a new website with Next.js. That sounds perfect. And then go ahead and fill in a couple of pieces of information that the platform engineering team asks for. And then that's gonna be put through pipeline automation, right? We're really good at pipeline automation. And that would go ahead and create my repository for me, build in my scaffolding, put together my build and deploy pipelines, configure Kubernetes for me. All of those things that could be ticket after ticket after ticket after ticket in the system. That all just runs while I go get lunch. <laughs> it's a lot better. So instead of waiting weeks, I'm back, I'm productive in just a couple of minutes. Now, Jody mentioned we built the catalog portion uh, on, on Backstage, and 
I know there's probably some folks in this audience who have started looking at configuring Backstage themselves. And it's just walls of YAML and code, and it's all in the back end, and it's a lot of work to set up. And we want to make sure that we're taking care of the platform engineers so they can take care of the developers. We've built a really lovely administrative interface where it's low code, you can just bring things in, get everything set up very quickly, very easily, and uh, yeah, it's just a much better way of doing it than hacking code all day. As much as I know you like coding. Right? <laughs> well, but, no uh, code yeah. is, low code is better. I can be more productive. I want the code that matters. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, I, I'm really excited about this. I think we've set up a system that platform engineers can use to really help developers stay in the flow and be productive all the time. Jody. It's, it's really exciting to see that. You know, it's the, I, I strongly believe uh, IDP is one of, the big, uh, 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 one of the big initiatives in almost every organization to fix developer productivity, because you can really, really reduce the developer onboarding time, the, the cognitive load they have. The complexity is so high. This is the, you know, the developers are doing a lot right now, but that's the problem that they're doing a lot, and we are asking them to learn too much all the time without making it easy. So we are very excited about uh, uh, Harness IDP, and uh, give it a try. We, have the, uh, we are showing it on the, on the demos outside but you can also sign up for our beta here. Our <laughs> Big hand to our engineering team working very hard on it here. So our next uh, module I'm going to talk about is Harness Infrastructure as Code Management. Infrastructure as Code is everywhere. Uh, almost everyone is using infrastructure code to some extent now, you know, most of the times uh, in, a, in a very significant way. But a lot of challenges around manageability of infrastructure as code. How do you manage it at scale? How do you manage, uh, you know, how do you bring right security, governance, automation, workflows, everything around uh, infrastructure as code at scale? And we heard it from a lot of Harness customers, and we decided to build, uh, build it out. And the approach that we took was, you know, the, if you have what we do for CD, uh, which is like you have a pipeline that automates the process of deploying code change. Can we bring the same concept to infrastructure change? Can we bring in a notion of an advanced pipeline uh, to, so that everything that you're doing through infrastructure can go through that? So that's really one of the, 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 the primary capabilities in our infrastructure as code management module, uh, advanced pipeline and PR automation for infrastructure as code, any infrastructure change you're doing, uh, OPA-based infrastructure policies for governance, you know, what we do for the rest of our platform, for CI, CD, feature flags, everything, we bring that to infrastructure as code. Uh, automated cost estimation uh, to control uh, the, the cloud bills so that you can estimate the cost at the time of when you're provisioning infrastructure through the through the pipeline and you know the cost is is, is too high then someone can uh, can reject that that particular change there right and finally, uh, state management. So you can manage the states, you know, things like Terraform states and all very well in a simple, seamless manner. So Eric, please go ahead and uh, show this to, uh, to, uh, to folks. All right, thank you. And I, I think this continues on on this theme of the platform engineers helping out the developer experience. So here I'm a developer and I am in a workspace. And this workspace helps me manage my cloud resources. So here I've got two AWS instances, an S3 bucket, and some networking configuration. And I don't need to know all the details of how Terraform works and the HCL language and all of that. I've got a really easy way of manipulating this. Because what my platform engineers have done is they've set up a handful of Terraform variables that I can manipulate to change how my infrastructure runs. And all I have to do is say, oh, I want to change my S3 bucket name and type in a new S3 bucket name. I want to change my instance type and change the size of my servers. And any time this has happened, we're logging it, we got a great audit trail, and we've got all of our pipeline executions. So let's look at one where we've changed the size of our, uh, S our instances. So here we've got very powerful harness pipeline with all of the configuration capabilities that you'd expect. So we've got normal Terraform steps like planning and applying our changes. But we also bring in security scans using TFSEC and Chekhov, very normal tools in the space. And we're running those in parallel to save some time, right? Because we've got a powerful pipeline. And then we've got grown up approval. So we can make sure that what we've planned is what we actually want. And we 
getting the outcome we want. And do I have to dig through a YAML file to understand that? No, we've got a beautiful user interface, right, to understand that. I can see, oh, we're changing two of our resources, and that includes my AWS instances. What are we changing? Said one thing, what is it? Oh, we've changed from a large server to a micro server. Really clear, really obvious how this all works. Well, there's a cost estimation here. Well, turns out when you change from a large to a micro, you save some money. That's really good. <laughs> Right, so it'll tell me, hey, we think this is going to be about 87% cheaper, right, for these AWS uh, instances. That sounds great. So I was able to review it, see that no violations on my security, the resource changes were what I expected, and it's going to save me money. That's going to give me confidence to approve this change and apply it into the environment. So simple for the developer to do that. Now let's talk a little bit about state. All right? if, if you've ever tried to host your own Terraform, you know state files are really important. They're, they're modeling the environment. And they're going to be a little tricky because they have a lot of secrets in them. So we need to have them stored very securely. We need to have good RBAC around that. Also, if multiple people are trying to make changes at the same time, you gotta make sure that's dealt with. You gotta have good locking in place. All right, we did all that. That's taken care of, it's in the platform, you don't worry about it. The other thing in here is we're keeping all the version history. So if it turns out that, I don't know, we've got a performance issue, we can say, well, what did we have as our configuration when this was not having a performance issue? Oh, right, we had large servers. So <laughs> we can move back from the micro to large. The troubleshooting is a piece of cake. So in the end, what we've got is a really straightforward developer experience where they can manage their infrastructure. But it's all well controlled. It's all done correctly because we empowered the platform engineers to set it up and do it the right way. So you do it the right way every time, and life is easy. Hey, thank you, Eric. Uh, big, big thank you to our engineering team working hard on it. Uh, but when we, when we look at uh, how we solve these problems, that's really the core of it. How do we get a great developer experience? But we get security and governance and cost and all the controls built into it. So developers don't have to have this friction with the controls all the time. The controls are part of the pipeline. Controls are part of the workflow. They are automated through your policies. And it removes the friction. And that's really the most frictionless uh, developer experience here. So let's uh, go back to the slides. Uh, and I'm going to talk about our uh, uh, latest module here that we are launching, Software Supply Chain Assurance. Uh, it's, it's a very big topic uh, in a lot of organizations. You've seen some very high profile attacks like at uh, SolarWinds and CodeCurve, where the, the, the challenges happen in the, the, how the, your software is composed. And every piece of software, every artifact now is composed of many, many uh, libraries, open source libraries, other commercial libraries. And you can have a security vulnerability and a security gap at anywhere. So like in the, if you, if you imagine uh, how cars are built, you, know, you, know, you get a car, but your steering wheel is built by someone else in the car, and the, st the parts inside the steering wheel are built by someone else, and those parts are built by, the parts inside them are built by someone else, and that's your entire supply chain. But the companies that are making the car, they track the entire supply chain. So if there is one defective part, they know who to recall, which cars to recall, they're the full supply chain. And those practices that have happened on, on manufacturing are starting to come into, so into software. Uh, the federal government uh, uh, issued an order, the executive order 14028, uh, very well known uh, that it requires every piece of artifact that will ever be deployed in the US federal government has to have a full software bill of materials, which is really how you track your entire supply chain. Uh, so now the, the responsibility of that starts coming into your DevOps and software engineering teams. And that's what we want to simplify with this module, that it's very easy and seamless to bring it all in your CI CD pipelines and your process to have full management around software supply chain assurance. What that means is that you can comply with the executive order. If you're required to com comply for your, your applications, uh, you can generate SBOMs with every build, get visibility and control over the, over the use of all any open source components there. Uh, you can achieve your uh, software integrity with Salsa compliance. 
And if something wrong happens, you have a zero day vulnerability or something that you need to do, a very great developer experience and developer oriented remediation workflow around it. So with me joining on stage is Monish, our uh, director of product management to, to show us how it works. Thank you, Jyoti. <laughs> Thank you, Jyoti, for the nice introduction and congrats on the launch of four modules today. Uh, so super excited to be here. So what I'll do is I'll walk you through how my pipeline is set up and take you through all the stages and then tell you the new steps that we're introducing with Supply Chain Assurance to strengthen your uh, pipeline. So as you can see on the top, I have the CI CD stages set up. At the build stage, I'm you know building my code base. I have the CD stage, uh, stage to deploy my app to dev to production with an approval. But what's new is in the build stage itself, we have added this super easy Salsa provenance option that basically helps you maintain the integrity of the application as it moves through different stages in a pipeline. So if tomorrow you want to question where my build is coming from, you can know that it's coming from a harness hosted CI build. You can also find out you know, if it was triggered by a known user or your code is being actually built from a known branch. So I've also added uh, you know, some of the execution steps here in my build stage. You can see I have shift left scanning set up from the STO security module that helps you find vulnerabilities early in the pipeline. But what's new with supply chain assurance is you can see that I can simply generate an SBOM right in my pipeline, uh, generate an SPDX or a Cyclone DX format uh, SBOM to uh, create the bill of materials that you can ship to your customers. More importantly, I can attest that SBOM to say that this SBOM belongs to this particular application. Now, going to my CD state, and let's see how that is set up, we have a new very cool step to make sure that your application has the enforcement set up before it moves to dev. And what you can do is simply create on the SSC enforcement step available out of the box to create a policy and block the open source components you know, before you want to release your software. So if you see a LinkedIn post tomorrow that speaks on you know, a zero day vulnerability and you want to make sure that you block it in your supply chain and you, you're sure that you know, you, your scanners may not be able to detect it or you, know, you, uh, you want to prevent it from going out to your customers, you need to simply get the name of the component of the library and with that version add it here, that's about it. Additionally, as I said, right, there's a Salsa verification step to basically enforce you know, the integrity of the application as it moves to the dev stage so that you, know, you can make sure that it's tamper proof and at the end of the day help you achieve executive order 1402 that Jody spoke about. So now let's move to the execution view, which is where the fun actually begins. As you can see here in my build stage, most of my steps actually passed when it came to shift left. But I see some success with you know, the SSC orchestration step. This basically tells me that my SBOM was generated, so I can quickly view that in this new artifacts tab, and I can download the SBOM from here for all the artifacts or the builds you're building in the pipeline. So let me quickly open this here in this new tab. And as you can see, right, there's an SPDX format-based SBOM that you can ship to your customers. It speaks on all the packages and the components that you're shipping in your software. A very important responsibility to kind of give to your customers because they need to know what components you're shipping uh, as a software producer. Now, going back to my CD stage, I think I've had a fair amount of success in you know, making sure that that passes. So if I go back to my execution history, and I see uh, one of the runs out here, seems like my Salsa verification step passed, but my build actually broke uh, you know, when it came to uh, the policy verification. And in order to view what that policy uh, violation looks like, you can go back to the artifacts step, move to the uh, deploy to dev output, and then see here that there was one violation. And it turns out that there was log4j that was accidentally being shipped out in your release and you wanted to block that in the first place. So today, we are giving you the assurance to make sure that you can block these zero day vulnerabilities from you know, going out in a software for all the open source components that you're using to build your software. Thank you, Jody. Right. Uh, 
big thank you to Manish and our engineering team working on it. But really, what we have tried to do is to remove a lot of the developer pain around it. You know, you want to ship a lot of software and you want to ship software fast, and you don't want to worry about that you're breaking things through. You know, there is a supply chain uh, vulnerability or a bug that you could be uh, you uh, you could be vulnerable to that you could be hacked on. So the more and more of that load you can take away from developers, it reduces the cognitive load. It gets them in the flow state. Uh, it's uh, it allows them to do f uh, fast feedback loops, and that's what fixes the developer experience. And that's what our mission at Harness is. We are very uh, you know excited today uh, to announce these new uh, new modules in our platform to continue to expand on that on that mission. That can we bring the engineering teams that that uh, the tools they need to drive engineering excellence and fix the developer experience that everyone struggles with. So thank you all for joining me here today.